Almighty God, as we come to worship you this day, pray that you would fill this place and fill our hearts with your Holy Spirit. Lay before us the footstones that we might find the path to joyful living through the one who gives us all, your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name I pray. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning to all of you who are in the pews and those of you who are watching virtually. Can everybody hear me? Good. I'll explain why I said that in just a minute. All right, so three boys are out um, tossing the ball one day uh, in the yard when one bragged to another, you know, my dad's a poet. And he scribbles a few words on a piece of paper and they send him a check for $50. And another boy says, well, my pop's a songwriter and he scribbles a few words on a piece of paper and calls it a song and they send him $500. And the last boy, not wanting to be outdone, says, well, my dad's a preacher and he scribbles a few words on a piece of paper, calls it a sermon, and it takes eight men to collect all the money. Well, I imagine that a lot of us are thinking about money these days. What we have, what we spend, what we save, what we share. And in today's gospel lesson, we get to go a bit deeper with those thoughts. Jesus introduces us to the parable of the wicked tenants. And it seems fine as long as you hear it from the viewpoint of the landowner. But let's look at it another way. And toward that end, with my own twist, if you don't mind, I'd like to rewrite the parable a little bit so that it's more friendly to those of us who live along or not too far from the Texas Gulf Coast. I'm going to change the parable, and I'm going to borrow a technique of the outstanding Episcopal preacher, Barbara Brown Taylor, by borrowing and changing. So let me tell this story to you. So once upon a time, there was a rich businessman from Boston who came south and bought a large fishing and seafood business off Galveston Bay. He had made a lot of money in the lobster business up north and thought he would give this a try. So he cleaned up some boats, made necessary repairs to worn out hulls, outfitted some for deep sea fishing, others with large drag nets for shrimping, and he hired captains and shipmates and brought on crews of people to clean and prepare whatever was caught. Now, he had to get back to the lobster business, so he leased the whole operation out to a local family for less than market value with the understanding that they would give him 10% of the profits. They had little business experience, and yet they had high hopes of owning their own operations one day, so everybody sealed the deal with a handshake, fair enough. The lobster tycoon got into his SUV, drove back to Boston, and no one in Galveston ever saw him again. Now, the tenants, they began to love the place like it was their own. They got to work before dawn to see the boats off, and they often worked hard until after dark. They carefully monitored the tides and hurricanes and even parasitic threats to sea life, and they did their best to see that no harm or excessive losses attacked the businesses. Now, come late summer, the catch was coming in better than ever. Fish were piled high as dump trucks, and there was no end to the variety, reds and specks and amberjack and grouper, flounder. And when the tenants would open up those shrimp nets, the catch would spill out onto the deck like a waterfall. But the summer season was coming to a close and the pace had to pick up a bit. So the tenants worked in shifts, half of them sleeping while the others caught and cleaned the fish. Inside a week, they had the largest catch they had had all summer, and they began to sell it like wildfire to the snowbirds who came down for the winter who were ready to stock their freezers for the months ahead. Well, happily exhausted, the tenants stood back admiring the fruits of their labor when they heard the sound of gravel crunching under tires behind them and turned around to see a car with Massachusetts tags filled with burly men. They parked. And they got out, and they began to shout orders to one another about seeing the books and getting to the local bank in time for proper payment. They didn't even introduce themselves to the tenants. And when one of them tenants came up to negotiate that 10% business, one of the big guys just picked him up and sent him out of the way. So the rest of the tenants held a little quick huddle and decided to introduce the visitors to the Texas Gulf Coast version of law and order. 
And one of them cranked up his truck and turned it in the direction of the men, while some of the others got hold of grappling hooks, cleaning knives, mallets, and before long, they had persuaded the business owner's thugs to return to Boston empty-handed. Get lost, they explained, and the big guys did just that. Now, you know what? The tenants were wrong. It was not their business. They had made a deal. The real owner deserved his take of the profits. But there's something about this story that maybe maybe doesn't sit just right. Maybe it's because no one likes an absentee landlord, or maybe it's because some of us had parents or grandparents who were in the fishing business, and we know such a life can be hard. Tending to another's business, bringing in another's cash, making someone else's profit. I think it's fair to say that suggesting the tenants were not really the owners seems to kind of run against the American way. I mean, from the very beginning, this country has fueled the dreams of the downtrodden with hopes of a better life. Those people, people seeking a little piece of paradise, perhaps through fish or shrimp or others through gas or oil or as a doctor or lawyer or rancher or teacher, working hard to make their dreams come true. That's the American way. To own your own home, own your own land, preferably bring in enough for some nice things and supper on the table. None of this always looking over your shoulder, handing your profit over to someone else stuff. Most of us in this country believe in ownership and autonomy and self-reliance. Some of us may not be able to pull it off, but, but these are the values we've been taught and they're the ones we strive to live by. But if Jesus is parable in the gospel lesson is to be believed, these values did not completely square with the values of the kingdom of God. You see, ownership of the fishing business is not the issue in my parable, nor is ownership of the vineyard in Jesus's parable. The business or the vineyard was not for sale, never would be. The owner is not looking for buyers. He's looking for good tenants who will give him his share of the produce at harvest time. The real issue is stewardship, a word that puts most of us on the defensive because it, it challenges our sense of ownership. I gave, if you were here last week, I gave you a heads up that I'd be bringing this up, so I'm making good on my word, which is why the doors are now locked. The ushers are standing guard, and I wanted to make sure the microphone was working. But what I'd like to try to do, and please just sit with me for a moment, is look at stewardship not so much as, as it relates to dollars and cents and budgets and expenses, but instead, let's ask for God's help. I'd like to try to deepen our understanding of what God has given to us and how he expects us to use it. As I said a moment ago, a lot of us are probably thinking about money these days. I mean, they pulled it out of a hat last night, but the constant specter of a government shutdown is no small matter. And interest rates and ongoing inflation, those are not insignificant. So really thinking this through and praying this through, it's not easy business. Most of us have worked hard for what we have, whether it's 100 acres or a double wide on a lot that's not much bigger. And we have deeds and we have titles and fence lines to prove our ownership. We have rental agreements and mortgage payment books and tax bills with our name on them. We've gone to a lot of trouble to get these things and hanging on to them requires no small measure of financial courage. And the last thing we want is to hear some preacher tell us that it, it doesn't even belong to us in the first place. And yet, according to Jesus' parable, it does not. Our ancestors became divine tenants so long ago that most of us have forgotten the agreement. Somewhere along the way, someone misplaced the original contract, which was a tenant's agreement, and wrote up a deed instead. The landowner, you know, spent most of his time out of state after all. He seemed pretty easy to handle. When he sent messengers to remind the tenants of the agreement, all it took was a little burst of violence, a few shouts of mine, mine, and, and all those who were still alive ran away empty-handed. You know, the owner could have sent thugs, could have sent soldiers. 
He could have returned violence for violence, but he did not. He just kept sending messengers one after another, each of them pleading with the tenants to come to their senses and honor the agreement with the owner of the land. And finally, when there's this whole row of unmarked graves full of messengers outside, let's say the vineyard walls, to use Jesus' example, the owner sent his own son, accompanied and unarmed, to teach the tenants some things that they had forgotten. He reminded them that ownership was a game they were playing, that they were actually guests on earth, not rulers. And there's some good news in that because being guests relieved them of certain responsibilities they were not gifted to handle, like deciding who got to be rich and who got to be poor, who got to work and who did not, whose claims to full humanity should be honored and who should be denied. He reminded them that being guests placed them in relationship with a host who placed them in relationship with each other and that once they got over their delusions of ownership, those relationships could actually be based on gratitude and not competition so that everything necessary for life could be shared in ways in which the lives of others than their own would be blessed. He reminded them as guests they had free access to far more than they could have ever earned for themselves. Let's borrow from my, my fishing metaphor. Instead of a fishing business full of small charter boats lined up along the bay, they had the whole ocean at their disposal, not to own, but to use and to enjoy through the generosity of the real owner of it all. And all he asked is that they take care of it and they give him a portion of what they produce. And this is important. Not because he needed it. He turned around and gave it away himself after all. That's all God does is give and give and give. He asked us to give because we need it. We need to give in order to remember who we are. Grateful guest who take our lives and give them as gifts to one another. Back to Jesus' parable, you know, the tenants of that vineyard were told, even killed the son too, but he would not stay dead. And to this day, he's, he's still kind of haunting fishing businesses and office buildings and households, reminding us that we're God's guest. Welcome on this earth and welcome to it so long as we remember whose it is and how it is to be used, remembering that we are not living on our time, we're living on borrowed time. And we can love it as our own. We can care for it and build on it and use it and protect it and take deep pleasure in whatever kind of harvest this life brings to us. We can even will pieces of it off to our children, naming them as our own successors in the stewardship of God's gifts to us. But let us not fool ourselves into believing for one minute it's really ours. And at the end of life's journey, we will have some kind of control over it. You know, post-COVID, I'm getting close to where I'm never going to use that again. But post-COVID and the roller coaster economy we've been living through these last few years, I suspect most of you have tried to gain back some of what you've lost. Maybe you dipped into your savings because you had a pipe burst during last year's freeze. We did at our home. Maybe like not one, but two of our neighbors, you had to move out of your house because your whole house was flooded and you spent funds you didn't wish you have to spend. It's okay. It's okay to want to put things back the way they were. It's okay to try and save. It's okay to have things. None of these run against the grain of the Bible's teaching about what we are given by God. But we cannot, if we are faithful disciples of Jesus, we cannot ignore the Bible's injunctions to the followers of Jesus to give back to God and to give to one another. As you ponder your stewardship, your pledge, that's where I'm getting at, but as you ponder, know that you're not alone in your own struggle to give back to God. I mean, we had to replace not one, but two air conditioning units in our house this year. 
and one of them had the drain back up and it flooded our dining room. One of those two blew out just as I was getting home from a long vestry meeting one night, made me want to say to God, well, if this is how you treat your friends, how do you treat your enemies? And when all that happened and all that happened in the last 12 months, I'll be honest, it was tempting to pull back. It was tempting to sit down and, and think, I'm going to change my pledge this year, which is the most I've ever pledged to St. Martin's in 16 years. But I know, I know deep down the promise I made, not only to St. Martin's, but to our Lord's work. And it's one that Laura and I prayed about. And I'm not sharing that to be braggadocious. I'm just letting you know that your priest and his wife have to pray and struggle with these kinds of decisions just like you do. But at the end of the day, I am reminded that none of what I think might be my own really belongs to me. It's being shared with me on a temporary basis. <laughs> and I'm being asked, and you are being asked to share in return. So brass tacks, then I'll land the plane. And then ushers, you can unlock the doors. So over the next few weeks, over the next few months, I want you to think about this. I want you to pray on this. And if you're faithful in your prayers, I promise you, God will guide you. I have yet to meet a person who came to know the joy of giving, who ever wanted to go back to the restraint of keeping. This is one of the main reasons we're using as our stewardship theme this year, joyful living, joyful giving, because as I wrote in my article in the Star for the month of October, the Apostle Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 9, 7, the Lord loves a cheerful giver. And that's not to say that he does not love non-cheerful givers. The Lord loves everyone. But there's just something about joyful giving that brings a smile to our Lord's face. And, and who doesn't want to do that? So all I'm asking on behalf of the vestry and really, frankly, on behalf of our Lord is the same thing I've asked you for the last 16 years. Pray before you make an important decision about what you pledge to the work of Jesus Christ in and through St. Martin's. And I mean that. Now, some of you have already got your packets and you've already filled out your cards and you've already sent them in. And some of you may not have prayed before you did that. So, if you did not pray, I'm going to ask you to either call us and have us send you another card or you'll see cards in the pews in front of you. I'm, this, I'm quite serious about this. So if you've already filled it out and you didn't take the time to sit down and pray or kneel and pray, then, then get another card, get home, pray, and ask the Lord to guide you, and then make your decision. If you already pledge here year after year, and you've responded to the teaching that suggests you give a tithe, that's 10% of what our Lord gives back to his work, then please continue to do what you've been doing. We need you to do that. Some people who pledged last year have decreased their pledge for this year already. Some have increased. We have some new pledges. I want whatever happens to be the fruit of prayer. If you pledge and you have not reached the goal of the tithe, then please take a step closer and increase your giving and then, really, the most important word for some of you here, and I don't know who you are, but if you do not pledge, right? And pledging is not dropping money in the offering plate. We can't make a budget on that. If you don't pledge to the work of Christ with that goal of a tithe in mind, if, you, if you've gotten into the habit of not pledging, which is about 55% of our members, 55%. So if you fall in that category, I'm going to ask a special favor of you. And only you know, I'm going to ask that you pray and ask the good Lord to finally release you from fear and discomfort, that you may truly experience what others find in the joy of giving, which in my mind, at least, is one of the pathways to joyful living if you believe in the work of our Lord and what he's doing in and through St. Martin's, please don't hold back. Support his work. Make a pledge. Do not let those who have given courageously have made that decision, those who made that decision, 
Don't let them carry this opportunity to support our Lord's work on their own. Join them and do so joyfully. We just heard read Paul's words. Rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say rejoice. And you may be in a place right now where my plea to you makes it hard to do with a joyful heart. You may have some family crisis going on. You may have some financial crisis going on. You may have a health crisis going on. I, I get all that. But Paul was writing that letter from prison. And he said, rejoice, rejoice. And then he says, bring everything that you need to the Lord and you'll know the peace of God which passes all understanding. So bring him even your fear and anxiety about giving. You know, if you look carefully, you will see messengers of God all around you. Those messengers are sent to remind us who we are and from where we came and who makes it all possible. We are God's fisher folk. We tend to his catch and all that comes with that catch on someone else's behalf. We are expected as disciples of Jesus to represent God's interest, not our own. We are supposed to be as generous with each other as God is with us. We're not the owners. We never were meant to be. But we are stewards. And what a blessing it is to tend to God Almighty's treasures. And if we can ever get our heads and hearts around that, I'll tell you something. We'll take a look at the catch that spills out of the nets around us and it will take our breath away. This, my brothers and sisters, is the pathway to joyful living. And I invite you to experience that joy in full by living the kingdom way. I am praying for you as you make this decision. I am praying for you. Thank you for your consideration. Amen.